So Dave Nantes and his wife and their one-year-old boy live in Michigan, where Dave serves as the director of campus ministry team at University of Detroit Mercy. He's been there for a couple of years and was at uh, other schools before that. He, ser- he uh, began his academic career here at Iowa State as a, de- as a degree candidate for a master's in biochem and uh, remembers the days when they used to yell, go clones, instead of go state at the games. Since then, he's gotten a master's degree in theology and philosophy. He spent several years in formation for the Society of Jesus, which is the Catholic religious order known as the Jesuits. He's written several articles about pop culture and spirituality and bioethics, so kind of a range. And he's played in rock bands for almost 20 years, including one memorable concert during Visha. So after the lecture, Dave will be happy to take questions or comments that contribute to the dialogue. And um, he will also autograph copies of this book that he just wrote, entitled Rock of My Soul, An Invitation to Rock Your Religion. And they're available from the bookstore right over there. So with no further ado, let's give Dave Nantes, an Iowa State alum, a warm welcome. Thanks a lot, Sherry. I appreciate you mentioning my book. Um, Just so you know, one dollar from every sale uh, goes towards my son's college education. So you can help you can help educate future generation. Did anybody here know Father Supple? A couple people. So it's October of 1992, and I'm in the old Iowa State or St. Thomas uh, Library. It's a Saturday morning about 9.30. Right when they open, I'm there. I'm studying for an exam that I had on on Monday. It's a beautiful day. It's about 55 degrees, blue sky, sunny. In other words, great Iowa State football weather. And there's a home game. And I'm the only one sitting in the library. And Father Supple comes in and had these swinging doors in the library. They both fly open. And then there's Father Supple, right? And he had this... You know, his typical uniform of his, his black pants, his clerical shirt, and then this gray button-down sweater, right? And he looks around, he's got those glasses, that, like half glasses, and he's looking around like this. And he sees I'm the only one there. And so he says, going to the game today? He's like, no, I got this uh, exam on, on Monday, so I, I really can't make it. He says, it would be a sin to stay inside on a day like today. So if anyone's wondering what I did after that, (laughs) let me just say that tonight I'm here to talk to you about rock and roll and not biochemistry. (laughs) This is a special place for me for a number of reasons, but this particular place um, is very special because it's sort of, it's like a melding of the two reasons why I'm here. I would say that at Iowa State when I first moved out here in 1992 was a place where I first said I was going to to be a, follow my spiritual journey as an adult. You know, and I think this is something that everybody has to go through in their life. Is to some point say that, yeah, it was great what, what parents and others did, teachers did for me up to a point, and now I have to decide as an adult, what am I going to do? How am I going to take this and run with it? Right? So this is a very special place because this is where I started to, to start asking those kinds of questions. And what will my life look like when it comes to a faith or a spirituality or something like that? It's also a special place because... I'm assuming that the M Shop is still, is still running. Uh, some of the best shows I've ever saw in my life were in that place. Um, I remember seeing Chick Corea there on the jazz side. I remember seeing a, well, a local favorite, House of Large Sizes. I don't know whatever happened to them, but um, great Celtic rock band from Minneapolis called uh, Boiled and Lead. Um, and uh, Leo Kotke, great folk rock artist as well. So. This place kind of merges uh, some of the two reasons, the two themes that I'm trying to present tonight. So it's a special place to be for me. Um, what I, let me start by saying what, I, what I'm not going to do is tell you the type of music or the artists that you should be listening to. My goal is to try to present some themes that would help you mine the music that you like for some spiritual meaning. Or maybe you're already doing that. And this is some, a different perspective on how someone else does that. Okay? 
Um, and so because that's my goal, I wanted to start out by, by asking you, and I'll give you a couple seconds to do this. If you could think of a rock song, and let's not, we don't have to quibble about the meaning of the word rock. I know it's a little ambiguous, but if you think it's rock, it's rock. So if you like softer stuff, if you like harder stuff, that's fine. But think of a song that you consider rock that has some type of significant meaning for you. And now what you could do, if you don't mind, is to turn to one person, and if you could share with them, share with each other, what is the song, who is the artist, and briefly, what meaning does it have for you? And I'll give you a little bit of time for that. That's right. Okay, would anybody like to ask for some uh, volunteers? If anybody would like to share, not what your friend said, but what, what, you, what you told them. Uh, I'll take a couple people if you'd like to share the song and the meaning for you. That's great. And it kind of touches into a human experience that we've all, we've all likely had, too, right? Anyone else want to share? Any of the good Catholics in the back row want to share? I have 75 by, by uh, Lion K. Oh, okay. And what's the meaning for you that, specifically? Just for me, specifically, it's um, kind of the ups and downs of life following God. Okay, excellent, excellent. Anybody else? Yes. Awaken Alive by Skillet. Okay, and what do you what do you like about it? It's just could you repeat it so people can hear? Awaken Alive by Skillet. Um, it's just basically kind of it's like a rebirth, like just figuring out like this is who I am and just coming to terms with who you are. Mm hmm Excellent. So this is something that, that you've already done, a number of you have already done, which is uh, found meaning in popular music, right? Now, let me tell you a little bit about me just because it helps to kind of set the context of what I'm trying to say. So, I just turned 40 last October. I was born six months after the Beatles broke up, right? So, end of an era, right? Now, whatever you've heard of the 70s, okay, they may have had bad furniture, bad clothing, and bad hair. However, music was great, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. And when I, in the late 70s, when I was eight or nine years old, I had a lot of older cousins, and they introduced me to, to rock music. Uh, so at that time, what was on the radio? The Who, Rolling Stones, ACDC. These are the kind of bands that I started getting into. Um, they were also Beatles fans, so that was another big one. Um, 
I love that music. And although I couldn't articulate it at the time, I knew there was something special going on because of the way I felt about it, it made me feel alive. And uh, there was something special. And as an eight-year-old, you know, what are you going to say? Um, at the same time, you know, I'm raised, I'm raised Catholic. And around that same time, I'm having my first communion, right? And again, I remember that day vividly, right? I had my powder blue suit. <laughs> Go back to the bad clothing of the 70s. And I also knew, even though, again, I could not articulate the meaning, the special meaning of what exactly was going on, I knew something unique and special was happening, right? And I, and I could tell by the way the, the felt experience of it that there was something important there. Again, even though I couldn't articulate as an eight-year-old what that was. So I've got these two things, very similar experiences, and it intrigued me that maybe there was some kind of relationship there. Now, to use an analogy here, to go into the, to the world of food, my wife loves peanut butter. She'd like to eat it by the teaspoonful when she was pregnant. My wife loves chocolate. Now, you may not agree, but according to her, if you put these two things together, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? So something like peanut butter chocolate ice cream is just, even though peanut butter and chocolate by themselves are amazing, you put it together and you just can't, you can't beat it, right? That's what she claims. So I think, well, if you, if you take two things you love and you put them together, shouldn't the whole be the greater than the sum of the parts, right? Well, and when, I was in the mid, when I was growing up in the mid-80s, as a, as a teenager, the only way that I saw that people tried to put these two things that were important to me together, faith and rock music, was Christian rock, right? Now, Christian rock as a, as a genre has, has evolved since the mid-80s, okay? But in the mid-80s, it wasn't really that good, okay? You had bands like Striper with their black and yellow spandex playing songs that sounded just like the hair metal bands of the 80s. They looked the same as the hair metal bands, but instead of talking about their girlfriends, they were, ta they were talking about Jesus, Okay, a little theologically shallow. Even at 15, I could tell that it wasn't it wasn't that great. Okay, I would say that again. This is this has evolved as a as a style of music. But for me, it made me uncomfortable. And I thought, well, why does it make me uncomfortable? I should love this stuff, right? I mean, this is I mean, it's got everything that that I love about life contained right in that. Why does it make me uncomfortable? Okay, now because I was raised Catholic and because I'm trying to. Uh, to talk about my, that experience kind of mingled with my, my uh, life in music, um, I started to think over time, well, maybe that had something to do with it. You know, Christian rock has very evangelical roots, right? Now, it started out of this thing called the Jesus Movement in California in the late 60s, uh, and then in the 70s, late 70s, it got a little more popular and then moved on uh, and has expanded into different, into different forms itself, right? Um, but I just wondered, you know, maybe that is something that the reason why it made me uncomfortable, right? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how, how is it that having been raised Catholic, what is it about the Catholic worldview that perhaps allows me to build a, a different kind of bridge, right? It's not a better or worse worldview, it's just a different worldview, right? Another thing, just, just to add, you know, another thing looking into this is the, you know, what does Catholicism have to say about rock music, okay? Now, early on, it wasn't very good things to say, actually. Um, in my book, I quote an article in America Magazine written by, by the Jesuit priest editors, uh, just totally lambasting Elvis Presley um, and in 1956, right? Now, let's jump up here to uh, 2001, I believe. <laughs> And here, hopefully you know two, at least two of the three guys in this picture. Uh, I don't know who the cardinal is in the background. Um, but obviously we have on the left, we have Bono, lead singer of U2, and we have Pope John Paul II, right? And Pope John Paul II, I mean, you could have a, you could have a whole workshop on what's going on in this slide, I think. Um, he's trying on Bono's shades, his signature shades, right? You never see the guy without him. And so here is an appearance with the Pope, and he asks him if he could try on his, his sunglasses, right? So at least, let me just, again, you could talk a lot about this, but one thing I would say is, like, the church's openness to popular culture, right? Later on, the Pope also had Bob Dylan play for him. Um, 
in May of 2000, there was a large open air music festival with over 200,000 young adults attended. There was a mass first that the Pope celebrated, and then right after there was a concert with the Eurythmics, Alanis Morissette and Lou Reed played, right? And there was a, a bishop, a local bishop, who was asked about it, Bishop Fernando Charrier, and he said, rock music, when it is performed by great artists, is stupendous. There is no diabolical rock. If anything, there are diabolical people. So a, pretty, a pretty radical statement um, from a high-ranking official in the church. Another way that I would say um, that I found that, um, at least in Catholicism, engaging in popular culture and in rock music, right? Pardon my poor Italian pronunciation, but the, the official Vatican newspaper is called the Zervatore Romano, okay? And they just recently came out with the top 10 rock albums of all time, okay? What are they? Number one, so here's the Vatican getting involved in one of the great debates of our time. This is not Sgt. Pepper's. It is not Abbey Road. They took a stand on Revolver. Okay. What's next? Oh, okay. Some, somebody yesterday in Cedar Falls at you and I insisted that that should have been number one, actually. <laughs> but obviously, a, at least an imagination that you could separate the sinner from the sin, right? <laughs> okay, Fleetwood Mac, Rumors. Uh, big breakthrough album. Now this one, has anybody ever heard of this one? <laughs> Donald Fagan, one of the founding members of Steely Dan, uh, 1980, he puts out this solo album. It's a um, sort of an observation about the Cold War, uh, Cold War mentality in the world, right? And the, the rock legend is that it took him 365 eight-hour days to complete this album, right? So a real labor of love here. Santana, Supernatural. Now, Santana played at Woodstock, for God's sakes, in 1969. But the, but the Vatican didn't really catch on to this until the late 90s with this album. This is the one with Rob Thomas, right, from Matchbox 20. Oasis. Enough said about that. Um, <laughs> Graceland, Paul Simon, mid-'80s. Album that, you know, won a Grammy Award for Album of the Year. Integrated a lot of... Um, music from Africa. A little controversial about um, was he uh, just a, a using people from another culture for their music and was he remunerating them properly. But an excellent album. Here's a really fascinating one and you wonder if, if whoever wrote this article uh, watched, watched uh, Wizard of Oz while listening to this. Of course, you have to slide you two in there. If you're going to have Bono come and do an audience with the Pope, then he's got to at least make the top ten. And then this final one is totally out of left field. I didn't even understand. I never even heard of this album before. But David Crosby, part of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. So interesting, though, so that the official Vatican newspaper has an opinion on what are the top ten rock albums of all time. So, so there is sort of a, a, a precedent here to say that the Catholic Church is willing to engage in rock and roll music, right? Maybe not accept it hook, line, and sinker, but to at least engage in it, right? I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, four ways that I think that, that you can build a bridge between spirituality and rock music, okay? And again, the first one I'm going to talk about, talk about the Catholic imagination. Again, this is coming from my own experience. This is a, uh, a topic that was written uh, a lot written about by Father Andrew Greeley, who is a diocesan priest from Chicago, also has a PhD in sociology, he teaches at the University of Arizona. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Another thing is I would talk about the sacredness of time, uh, as well as the sacredness of the body. And then finally, and I can't, I can't pretend this has any kind of really intense theological significance, but just the rock music enabling someone to feel joy at being alive. Okay, which I think is ultimately a good spiritual lesson. So Catholic imagination. What's the difference? Again, it's a difference of emphasis. It's not a, this is not a judgment call. It's just it's showing a difference of emphasis traditionally in Protestant, evangelical Protestant and Catholic circles. How do people look at the world, right? 
You see that Catholics are expected to be communitarian because of an imagination of society as sacramental. Sacramental meaning being able to see the work of God in the world, right? God is more imminent than transcendent. Or, as Greeley says it, God is more like the world than unlike the world, right? So the sacramental sense, and if you think, those of you who are Catholic, and if you think about the sacraments that, that you celebrate, right, what are the materials that we use in sacraments? Well, we use water, we use bread, we use wine, we use oil. Look at the, look at the typical Catholic church. What are the things that have holy, holy meaning, right? Candles, stained glass, right? It's an artistic, aesthetic sense, right? So now I did this... This comparison here, Christian, I said this, Christian Rock versus the boss, right? Now, people say, oh, the boss must be the Pope. No, the boss is Springsteen, but um, I suppose the boss should be the Pope, but that's not what I'm referring to here. The stuff that I listened to, again, in the mid-'80s, when I was talking about first being introduced to Christian Rock and what was the un how why did it make me feel uncomfortable, right, is because even though today it's, I don't think today this is the case, but in the mid-80s, the goal was evangelization, right? So if the primary goal of the music you're writing is other than making good music, right, then that's different. Evangelization is the goal. Then it really doesn't matter if the music is great or not, you know? So what about artistic integrity? Um, well, that's weighed a little less. As long as it's evangelizing, right? And what's the point of evangelizing, at least for that? for this group, is bringing people to the faith, right? You appeal to the masses, bring people to the faith through this mode that sounds very, very similar, if not identical, to the stuff that they're already listening to, right? In evan evangelical circles, there's a very big focus on the word, right? Scripture is the authority, right? That's... Obviously, in Catholicism, Scripture is important, right? But there are other things, like things like tradition, things like hierarchy, things like this, that are important as well as, a, as authoritarian. But in the evangelical world, the word... And so it doesn't, it's not shocking, then, that the main distinction between mainstream and Christian rock would be the lyrics, right? Again, as I was saying, this is an emphasis. It's not that... It's not that Catholics don't care about this, the suffering and death of Jesus, but we're talking about an emphasis, theological emphasis, right? And then talking about the body as sexuality in the body is suspicious. Um, again, sacramentality, as Greeley states, um, Greeley even says, goes so far as to say, you know, people who self-identify as former or non-practicing Catholics, that's fine. That means they don't go to church anymore, but you really can never escape it because it kind of just gets seeped into your marrow, right? And you see the world in a different way, in a sacramental way, just because of that. He said the world is more like God than unlike God. God is found in all things. A, sort of a, a phrase attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola, finding God in all things, uh, which is a very Catholic understanding. Now, just to prove that I listened to music after 1989, another band that I think that is, uh, has this same sacramental sense is this band, The Hold Steady, from out of the East Coast. And Craig Finn, the guy who's in the front there with the glasses, lead singer and guitar player, good Catholic boy, went to Boston College, graduated in 93. Um, again, does, doesn't sort of self-identifies as a a non-practicing Catholic. Um, but in a great article in America Magazine about the Hold Steady, I'd like to read a quote. Although Finn does not currently consider himself a practicing Catholic, the grand themes of faith stuck with him, especially the possibility of forgiveness and redemption in human life. Another thing about the Hold Steady that is one of the things that they take pride on is their live show number one, and secondly, their ability to form community, right? Have you ever been to a, everybody been to a, to a concert, you know, a popular rock, rock music concert before, right? You ever look around and you ever realize that there is no way that these people would be together in any other forum if it weren't for this, 
right? I mean, there's no, there's no way these people would come together otherwise, right? They do that well. It's something that a, a philosopher of music, Kathleen Higgins, calls social cohesion. They form community well, right? So it's something that they pride themselves on, and it's something that, you know, not surprisingly, um, people of faith pride themselves on, right? Forming community. I want to talk a little bit about um, they're calling the sacredness of time. And I'm, for this, I'm borrowing a, um, from a theologian. His name's Jeremy Begbie. He's from London. And he's, he's a great uh, classical music uh, piano player, right? But I've taken his stuff and I'm just applying it to rock music, all right? But don't tell him. I don't know if he'll appreciate it or not. But music. And well, let me put it this way. I think every age has temptations, right? Certain times are tempted towards certain things, right? Now, we live in an age, amazing technology. And I've been tempted at times to think that I can transcend time. I mean, really, I mean, you can text a friend in Australia and get an immediate response, right? I mean, you don't have to wait for anything. Why would I have to wait for anything, right? I can get it immediately. That might be something that we are tempted to in our society, given the technology that we have, right? Now, music, you can't transcend the time. Music only works by unfolding in time, right? Now, you might say, I, I love this song. There's this great song, and at 2 minutes 13 seconds to 2 minutes 16 seconds, there's this great drum fill. It goes like this. Da -da 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 Does anybody know what that is, by the way? Yeah, Phil Collins, all right? You saw Mike Tyson going crazy over that in The Hangover, right? So, so you just knew that with my really terrible rendition of that, using my mouth, right? Uh, you can't just fast forward it, even though you can with digital music, up to 2.13 and then play it to 2.16 and then expect people to respond. It doesn't make any sense in that way. You can't take it out of the context of the song and expect it to make any sense. Music only works because it takes us through major and minor tensions and releases. That's how it works. One of the ways, if you want to draw a parallel liturgically, and this is interesting because next week in, in the Christian church is Holy Week, right? And if anybody is Catholic or anybody is Anglican or other Christian denominations, you have a whole week where you celebrate this. You ever ask yourself, why is it that we celebrate Christmas in one hour at church and Easter has to unfold over a whole week or the Triduum, the three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then finally Easter? Why is that? Do you think, I mean, I, I wasn't there and I'm not a scripture scholar, but I'm pretty sure Mary only labored for one hour or 45 minutes with a short homily. No, I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen, you know? Having been with a woman as she was giving birth before, it's, it doesn't happen that quickly, right? But I think it is a brilliant, it is a brilliant thing in this way um, that we celebrate Easter the way that we do, okay? So here you are on Holy Thursday, and you're, you're, you've been revved up for this all year. This is the high holy day in Christianity, right? And Easter is, anyway. But you're getting ready for it. And here he is. We're entering into these high holy days, right? And so the Last Supper, the washing of the feet, you know, this incredibly moving experience, right? Then you move to Friday, kind of a downer, okay? And if you were, when I was a kid, my mom dragged me to church from noon to three. I'm like, why are we at church in the middle of the day, mom? You know, well, this is very significant. It's a special, it's a very, and if you enter into the experience, if you really enter into the experience, right? It, it, it kind of, it does bring you down. You should feel down, right? And then you have Saturday. Now, Saturday is completely desolate, right? There's, there's nothing, right? At least in the, in the faith, in the tradition, the belief is Jesus is dead, he's buried, and he doesn't come out until Sunday, right? So maybe by Saturday late morning, you're like, okay, I've had enough. Let's, uh, let's move this along, folks, right? But the brilliance of the tradition is that no, you can't. You can't do that. You can't rush it. Because it's not our time, right? It's not about us and sending quick text messages. It's about getting into the experience. And the tensions have to be there if the release is going to feel 
like it does, right? You can't celebrate and have the joyous experience if you don't have the, tension, the tense, desolate experience first. So I was, I'm suggesting that just, just listening to rock music, since, I mean, I suppose you could do this for all, a number of types of music, but since, since many people listen to rock music, just listening to rock music and allowing it to unfold in time is a good spiritual exercise for us. And allowing us to pay attention to what's going on within us as we surrender ourselves to the time of the music. Right? One of my favorite examples, this doesn't have to be yours, I mean this is a really old song, so, you know. <laughs> um, song by The Who, this came out in 1970. The year I was born, won't get fooled again. Does everybody know this song? If you watch CSI, I suppose you've seen, you've heard this song in the introductory uh, credits there. So, this is a song where it starts out with this really brash guitar chord, and then you got the drums coming in, and then you got you know verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, and then all of a sudden it cuts out, right? Now, if you've been listening to it and paying attention to yourself the whole time, you realize that all of a sudden you're kind of kind of a breather, right? You're, as you hear this synthesizer, this light synthesizer in the background, and your pulses started to slow down a little bit, right? And you started to get into it a little more. And then all of a sudden it's interrupted. And it's interrupted by this guy, Keith Moon, up front with the white jumpsuit on. Coming in, sounding like he's got eight arms. And he's beating on the drums, and he's not beating on the drums just straight, like that. He's beating on the drums with a syncopation. And what does syncopation do to people if, if you're listening to it? It shakes you up, right? Because we're used to the one, two, three, four. Syncopation shakes us up. And so all of a sudden we go from this droning synthesizer calming down into this, this incredible drum syncopated part, right? And then... That moves through for a while, a few measures, and then all of a sudden you've got the snare drum, and then the release. Probably the one, one of the most cathartic moments in rock music ever. Right? Roger Daltrey, the man on your far left, lets out this barbaric howl, like it's from another world. Right? Now again, if you were to listen to that scream by itself, you'd say, what in the world is that? You know, it, it sounds brash. It's kind of annoying if you were to just to hear it by itself, right? But in the context of the song, the release is just phenomenal. And if you give yourself to the song, and it's kind of a long song compared to other songs played on the radio, as it unfolds, it has this incredible payoff. Now, I wrote, I wrote this article in America Magazine appeared a few weeks ago, and, and I expressed I was talking about this very topic, right? And interestingly, somebody wrote in a comment on the website about it. And this is, and I thought it was really interesting because I hadn't even thought about this. Also, I'll read what this gentleman said. And to experience just how cathartic Roger Daltrey's scream is, watch The Who's performance on YouTube of Won't Get Fooled Again at the post 9-11 concert for New York. All of the rage, all of the sadness, all of the anger, all of the confusion felt by the country after the towers fell, and especially that felt by the first responders who were the guests of honors at the concert, seemed to be captured in the band's performance and in the audience's response. Truly one of rock and roll's greatest spiritual moments. So I was pretty consoled by that because I hadn't even thought of that. And somebody taking this song and putting it in a different context and seeing again what did that release from that tension, what did that do for these people, right? Does that make sense? A little bit anyway? It's kind of a, it's kind of a heady theological thing, so I need to lighten it up a little. You know, the most maligned people, maybe on the face of the earth, are rock and roll drummers. You Google rock and roll drummers and you'll get a list of jokes about three miles long, right? So since I'm a self-effacing, uh, self-deprecatory guy, how did the rock band tell that the stage was level? Because the drool was coming out of both sides of the drummer's mouth. <laughs> and did you hear about the rock and roll drummer who graduated from college? Yeah, neither did I. <laughs> Next thing I want to talk about is the body, just briefly. Um, 
talked about the body as sacred. One of the, one of the main tensions in Christianity, and it's been, there's been like a tug of war, and it's a good tension because it helps us to sort of remain in balance. But the tension in Christianity has been between the flesh and the spirit, right? Flesh and the spirit always pulling at each other, which is one of the early reasons why early rock and roll was kind of put down by religious people is because it seemed to appeal too much to the flesh and not enough to the spirit, right? Which makes some sense. There's an article by uh, Tom Bedoin and Brian Robinette um, talking about rock music's effect and how you can mine it for spiritual meaning. And they, and they look at this particular theme, okay? It would seem then that if that's a main tension in Christianity, that if you could find some way to negotiate that tension and bring things together, the body and the spirit together, that that would be a very healthy thing for religion. And they, they propose that rock music can do that. How does it do it? Listeners can rediscover a rootedness in the body, so we are embodied individuals. You can't, you can't escape it, and why would you want to, right? But, but at the same time, experiencing the body's expansion, the body the spirit transcending the body as it seems to fuse with the music. Now, again, you may not be thinking this as you're standing in front of a large amplifier at a rock show that, oh, I'm having an experience of transcendence and bodiliness at the same time, right? But we're trying to build a little bridge here and to try to say that this tension doesn't necessarily have to exist. I mean, it's good that we have this tradition but maybe rock can help us negotiate a space where the spirit and the body can come together. Now, as a drummer myself, um, I can state, you know, some of the most meditative moments for me, you know, and for drummers, you have to do four different things with four different limbs at the same time, right? It takes a lot of work. It's, it's difficult. But once you get it, and if you're jamming with somebody else and you lock in, and you can sort of zone out and you don't even have to think about it after a while. You have the muscle memory take over. Okay? That's an incredibly meditative experience. And just to prove that you know, this is not just my opinion, I'm going to give you a quote here from a, a Dutch theologian, kind of an obscure guy, Edward Skillebex, right? This is 1963, right? and he's writing in this book about Sacraments and the encounter with God, right? Say, well, what, what does that have to do with anything? Here's his analogy. Just when a drummer is playing, he is extending himself through all his bodiliness into the instruments grouped about him so that these instruments dynamically participate in the very expressiveness of his rhythmic movement, making but one total movement, which arising from within the drummer flows through the rhythm of his body through his beating hands, through his stomping feet, and produces a varied harmony of percussion. So too, the heavenly saving will of Christ through his glorified body makes one dynamic unity with the ritual gesture and the sacramental words of the minister who intends to do what the church does. This guy, I don't think Skillebex knew a lot about uh, rock music, frankly. Okay, But he could tell, because of the bodiliness and the carnal nature of drumming, that there was something going on there that he could easily draw an analogy with to this deep theological point that he was trying to make. Okay. So, I think this is an important theme that, that Rock can, can help us elucidate. Okay, Rock and the Joy of Being Alive. Now, Again, I warned you, this is, not a, this is not an incredibly deep theological point I'm trying to make, but I think that, that sometimes people need to be not converted to specific, to specific um, religions and, and organized, organized religions, but they need to be converted to life, right? And I think, as uh, Irenaeus, an early theologian in, in Christianity said, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. I think that this is, again, this is a very spiritually important point. Um, we are given life, right? It's important. We need to revel in it, right? As one example, and I understand, I'm going to show you a little video clip, and I understand it's not exactly something you see every day, but it'll be interesting. I'm just going to give you time just to read this quote.
Okay, this is a quote from a Capuchin Franciscan priest who fronts his own heavy metal band. And he calls the name of the band is Fratello Metello, which means brother metal. Righteous. More a CC top than Gregorian chant, meet Fratello Metallo, the heavy rock friar who's wowing metal fans in his native Italy. Brother Metal, as he's known in rock circles, is Brother Cesar Bonizzi, a 62-year-old Capuchin monk who got the calling when he went to a Metallica concert 15 years ago. I felt the energy released by this type of music and fell in love with heavy metal. After three years, I composed my first record, Metallo. The former African missionary has just released his 18th album, Mysteries, a litany of songs about sex, alcohol, God, life and tobacco. Earlier this month, his band opened the Gods of Metal Festival in Bologna, sharing the bill with the likes of Iron Maiden and Slayer. There are some who say that a man of God shouldn't be singing the devil's music. Heavy metal has long been associated with Satanism, a link Brother Cesar disputes. Describing himself as a preacher singer, the friar says his music isn't aimed at saving souls, but rather converting people to living life to the full. I am religious and I am a priest. I believe in it and I put my whole life into it. But I don't play to draw people closer to Christ, to the church or to religion. I do it to convert people to life, to understand life, to grab hold of life, to savor life, to experience life and enjoy it. Full stop. Following his success in Italy, where he's built up a loyal fan base, Fratello Metallo is now contemplating a world tour, clad, of course, in his customary friar's habit. Helen Long, Reuters. And just for the record, he did not bite the head off any of those goldfish. I just want to make that clear. Um, so what, what he said, it's kind of striking at first. Why is, he, why is he playing music, right? It comes out, especially from somebody like this, right? Um, but I think, it, I think it points to this thing I said at the beginning with this Catholic sensibility, right? There is really no need to be so overt about it if you have the sacramental sense of, of the life as containing ways of, of getting in touch with God, right? Getting in touch with your spirituality, Right? It's redundant, in a way, to say that you're going to do it for these specific religious reasons. Right? He's doing it to convert people to life. And by doing that, you convert to life. If you have a sacramental sense of life, then that's exactly what you're doing. Right? You are converting people to look at spirituality in the world. Right? Now, I started this um, by asking you to think about a song. Right? that had meaning for you. And again, I'm not here to tell you the songs that you should listen to or to tell you what the spiritual meaning of the songs that you already like. I'm trying to give some tools so that you can do that for yourself. But it's only fair that I share with you something that's important to me. And this is a, this is a song. Uh, there's a lot of songs that I think that I could have chosen. But I think I, because Father Greeley that I quoted earlier on had talked about Springsteen, I was going to use Springsteen as as this, oh no, first it's my kid, yeah. I forgot about that. What's the use of having a kid if you can't dress him up in a rock and roll onesie, right? <laughs> I show this to my friend uh, Tom Bedoin. He teaches theology at Fordham University. He's a huge Rush fan. He said, Dave, I have two responses. Number one, awesome. <laughs> Number two, exhibit A for 15 years when he's in therapy. Perhaps. But the reason I put this up there is to say that, you know, I struggled for a long time to try to build these bridges between what I felt was important in my spiritual growth, my spiritual journey, and the music that I loved. I'm hoping that it's not as hard for him. <laughs> and one of the ways that we could do this, perhaps, is to give people space to talk about the ways that they find meaning in popular culture, right? Um, I don't know if we really do that. I mean, when we come together, those, anyone here who, who practices an organized faith and goes to a church or a synagogue or a, or a mosque, 
Um, are there ever chances to do that? Are there ever chances to talk about how you find meaning in other parts of your life? In that context, right? And I'm hoping that that would be one suggestion that I would have that people would do so that we could find these bridges a little easier. Right? And then we wouldn't be afraid of admitting that, yeah, you know what? My faith is an incredibly important way that I find meaning in life, but I have these other ways too. You know? And so I, my, my, my hope for my son and for, for all of you and for other generations is that that doesn't have to be as difficult. Now, I also think that you know, I'm not going to try to force my taste on him, although I sort of kind of want to do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to make him listen to Journey or Sticks or whatever, I suppose. Um, but I think that's an important question to ask, is that when do we have these opportunities to talk within that kind of a faith context about things, other things that, that give us meaning? Right? So now on to, to the boss I was referring to before. Um, the reason I like this song, it's called Badlands, and I want you to think when I'm playing it, there's the four themes I talked about. Right? So if, think about, like, what does this say about the joy of being alive? What is Springsteen trying to say about the joy of being alive? What is he trying to say through the lyrics, which is important? It's not exclusively important, but what is he saying about the lyrics about sacramentality, the, the importance of redemption, for one example? Right? How does he use his body? How, do the, how does the band use their body? How does the audience use their body? What is the experience that the audience is having? Right? And think about all those things as you, as you watch this. And also, how it unfolds in time. And it's about five minutes long, so this is kind of a test for you to let it unfold in time for you. Uh, and then after this, I can, I can take some questions.
Not bad for a 60-year-old guy, I guess. And I don't realize it's uh, 8 o'clock, so if there's anybody that has to take off to something else, please feel free. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer some questions, or even better, if you have any comments. This is a, sort of an ongoing conversation I'm having, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, so is there anybody that would like to ask a question or anything? We got the mic, too. Yeah, I think it's working. Well, I'll say I feel a little less guilty about my obsession with the Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> right, Misty? As one of the, someone who grew up before the rock music, is there, a, is there a concern for manipulation by the performers? Because surely it looks like they're manipulating the audience. And that's always scared me a little bit. Oh, okay, do you have, well before you give up the mic, do you have a, anything in particular, type of manipulation you're thinking of? Or? Well, just it looks like the emotional state of the audience is, oh, right. is kind of beyond rational. Oh yeah, absolutely right, right, right. And well, I think I, I guess I I'm not sure I trust that then. Well, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, because you've had you have had times, for example, where these tragedies happen. Um, there was a Who concert in Cincinnati in 1978 where uh, 11 people were were trampled to death, right? So absolutely, this is that's a that's a huge concern. I think at one point when people describe though the experience that they're having. Right, and this is now. Granted, this is anecdotal information that I've just gathered, personal experience. Right, it sounds often to me it sounds a lot like mystical experiences. Like this is stuff like Teresa of Avila was writing about when she was taken up in these prayer experiences. Incredible desire and fervor. Um, now she wasn't in a mosh pit or anything, so this is a, is a little different here. So it's the expression, but that's what I'm talking about with the bodiliness. Um, this is why I think, for example, that if you watch people play, you know, people do air guitar, right, or air drumming at concerts and stuff like that. Why do they do that? You know, I think it goes back to this idea that they've sensed themselves as a bodily individual. That we're not always aware, in every second of the day, that we're a bodily individual. When they're listening to the music and how it makes them feel, then they're then they're all of a sudden they're aware of it and they need to express it in some way. So I, I agree. There are there are negative ways to do that. And there are certainly examples of people that try to get a whole group of people rallied up for really bad reasons by using music. I mean, there are, there are misogynist and racist reasons, for example, to do that. Um, and then, but I, but I just don't, so I, I, in one way I agree with you that it is a possibility, you know. I'm not, I don't like to say the, the you know, uh, right from the beginning that it's necessarily bad right away. It's like, what is the goal here? What is the the end being sought, I guess, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, kind of just to keep going along with that, I remember one yeah. of the things you said in the beginning was that um, uh, rock is not diabolical. It's, the, it's that humankind or one, one or two individuals can be diabolical. Um, and that just rolling with that, we, we are given the responsibility as human individuals to take this gift and use it for good or for worse. Um, and it's both the responsibility of the the artist who is performing to mm -hmm. to take care of the audience who are they who they are manipulating either for better or for worse um, or to and then also it's the responsibility of of the audience to know what they're getting themselves into right um, right that's a good point but and it can still be uh, it, if both of them are working together at it then it can be that kind of transcendent that's experience. that's excellent and I, I like what you said because sometimes we don't really talk a lot about the responsibility of the artist, right? We, or the responsibility of the artist is to just like deliver a show because I paid my money. It doesn't go anything beyond that. But I think you may raise an excellent point. There is something beyond that. There are responsibilities there.
I learned to wait because when I teach philosophy, the Chronicle of Higher Ed had this article that the average time between when a teacher asks are there any questions and when they move on is somewhere between two and three seconds. Any questions? Okay, so not seeing anything. So I have no problem with a little lull in the uh, conversation. But ultimately, I'm, I'm happy to stick around. We have this room till just before 8.30. So if anyone has anything they want to talk about, um, please feel free. Do you ever get any kind of um, resistance or any kind of, do people argue much about what you said? I mean, do they, you get a lot of disagreements with what you, what you like, what you told us today? I, I think it's extreme cases, not, you know, someone just kind of doesn't agree with you or what, but. Not as much, you know, when I was, when I was in the seminary and my, my, um, the, the order was very, was very um, helpful and supportive of me to continue pursuing music. Right, so I was playing in, in rock bands during that time. And when that is, interestingly, I think that touched upon some nerves because people thought, well, they, I guess they had this notion of what rock music was and what someone who's studying in a seminary should be, and they just didn't, they didn't go together. And so when, it, when that was the case, I did have people ask me about that. Um, not, not as much now, although this is, again, I was trying to make clear that, that this is a very... Um, Trying to make, it's about Catholic sensibility of, of being raised in this particular way. You know, there might be other people that you have a great dialogue with because they were raised in a different way, and they could say, well, wait a minute, I see it this way. Or like I said, those four themes that I said, th those aren't exclusive at all. I think people could easily posit that there are other ways that they've found to build this connection. Um, if anybody's interested in it, there's a, great, there's a great blog that started about two years ago. It's called rockandtheology.com, and it's written by theologians who are also uh, uh, rock musicians, uh, people that teach in, in university, at the university level who are also rock musicians. It's an excellent, excellent forum for this kind of stuff. And some of the people on that blog uh, would say, yeah, I agree with half of what you said, but I'm going to throw this in there, you know. So now, now I see it's less of a disagreement and more about a conversation that it's kind of an ongoing thing that I'm, I'm trying to cultivate anyway. The book I brought, it makes a great Easter gift too. just want to throw that out there. So. But I really appreciate you coming and listening and, and uh, I, I hope that you gain something from this. Um, one more question? Oh yeah, one more. Um, before you mentioned that, um, I guess Christian rock uh, may be a little bit uh, shallow. But is there any Christ are there any Christian artists that you would recommend? Well, I was yeah, I was trying to say that the stuff in the mid '80s, right. you know, that was it. I, I think you know I heard stuff recently. Um, there's this band Red, and that I found that I found to be really good. You know, and the interesting thing about them is that they seem to kind of appeal to this sensibility that I'm talking about, um, because it, it didn't have the old cliched stuff that the '80s stuff did. You know, in fact, in fact, they seem to be really uncomfortable with the label, to be quite honest. You know, um, not because they wanted to just break in the mainstream. It's just that I, I guess at some point someone picked up on this faith aspect and then ran with it. This has happened before with other bands who really didn't want to be pigeonholed like that but ended up having to kind of carry it with them, right? So, yeah, I think, I mean, absolutely. That, that, um, there, are, there are people, uh, there are bands and other musicians uh, that might flirt with the idea that that's what they are, you know? Um, but I, but you, can, you can really tell the authenticity, though. That's what really struck me, is that they're musicians and the music comes first. You know what I mean? And there's something, there's something sacred about that, I think, about taking what you have and putting it out there, um, finally honing and crafting something. Right? I mean, I think that's, I think that's very important. Uh, take pride in what you do. And, oh, yeah. Just um, kind of out of personal experience, mentioning Red, I know there was a mention, someone mentioned Skillet earlier. Um, I went to Laser Fest last year, um, and many bands, uh, including Red and Skillet, were there. And just from personal experience, there really is nothing like being in a crowd like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even have to be religious to feel that there is something 
immensely spiritual. I mean, you're you know usually jumping up and down with thousands of people, mm -hmm. and you're united as one. And I mean, it is almost like an out of body experience. You get over with it. You're just like, whoa. Yeah. There's, I mean, to be honest, I mean, just coming from personal experience, if you haven't been to a rock concert, there's nothing like it. And right. It is a sp very spiritual, very personal thing, but at the same time with the crowd around you, with the band, you feel kind of connected as a whole through the music, through the, you know, bodiliness, as, as was mentioned, with everyone around you. And you really just, I mean, it's indescribable. There's nothing else like it. I think that's excellent. And, you know, one of the things is, Two things first. First of all, somebody in Dubuque said when they when I was showing this, and they said, you know, you didn't even really have to play the sound, and it was, still would have been communicated exactly what you're saying. The other thing, though, I think is interesting. I think we need to develop this more. Is that we have an amazing tradition and talking about spiritual language. We have great spiritual language. We don't have a lot of good language and ways to articulate what you just said. Now you, you've said it better than, than I've heard it in a long time. <laughs> but usually we don't have that way of, people say, you know, when they say that really rocked, right? Well, we kind of know what they mean, but, but that's about as far as it gets, right? What does that really mean? What's underneath that, right? We don't have the language to talk about. Or in the jazz world, that really cooked. Right? That's what people say. You know, well, we kind of know what you're talking about. I can, I sort of know what you mean. You know, if the hair on your arm stood up, you know, stuff like that. You know, but we don't, we don't really have developed this in this uh, sort of a spiritual language for describing what you're saying here. Um, so yeah, I think there's, I think there's some more work we could do there. Absolutely. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think that's that's right on. <laughs> <laughs> right on. You're showing your age. Um, I think we need to wrap up for tonight, but if you'd like to talk more with David, he'll be signing his books over here by the bookstore table. Feel free to, to buy one and have it autographed. And then he will also be tonight at St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Thursday night liturgy starts at 9.15, and David will be our guest reflection giver at that Mass. So feel free to come on by. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs>